So generally speaking, building codes call for at least two emergency exits. One will not do. And the logic being is that if there's only one emergency exit and there is an emergency, there's a fire or what have you, and that, that exit becomes impassable, then you would have no way out to safety. So multiple escape routes are necessary. So that makes total logical sense for us. There's got to be, there's got to be more than one way to safety. We can ask ourselves, does this apply? Does this, we might say this, this building code principle, does this building code principle apply to God's rescue plan? Does God give many avenues of salvation? Now, a lot of people would like to think so. But what does God actually say? And what does God's word teach? We're continuing today on a series called The Foundations of Faith, where we're going through the basic building stones and foundation stones of the Christian faith. We've considered that the Bible is trustworthy and true. We've examined some of whom God, uh, God is revealed to be in that Bible, that he is the creator of all things, that he is the great I am, that he is the one true God, and that he is omni, he is limitless and boundless in all that he is. We've reflected on the rebellion of mankind, that, God has rebe that, that mankind has rebelled against his creator God, and that the consequence of this separation from God has been death in every way, spiritual and physical, that we've become mortal. And we've looked at Jesus. The incarnation, God in human flesh. And last week, Kyle shared on the fact that Jesus was crucified, that Jesus has risen, and that Jesus has promised to come again. This Jesus was sent by God the Father. In Jesus' own words to a Pharisee named Nicodemus in John chapter 3, not to condemn the world but to save the world, or to rescue the world. Saved from what? Let me ask you that. So <clears throat> we could say saved from what? Maybe we can even think about saved unto what? Saved from what? Saved unto what? Jesus said, I haven't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. From what? Unto what? What's that? Evil? The devil, sin, say that again, from death to life, so it's interesting in this conversation that Jesus has with this uh, Pharisee Nicodemus, he, he frames it, at least in that instance, really as this rescue from a, a position that we already stand in before God, a current standing before God. Because as he's talking to him, he says that people already stand condemned. He uses this word condemned. We, st we, we stand condemned already before God. That, that our, our current position before God is this, is this guiltiness <laughs> before a perfect and holy creator God. So then Jesus in this conversation foreshadows what's going to happen, right, to take care of that. He's like, just as Moses raised up that, that, uh, that bronze serpent in the desert, the Son of Man must be lifted up. And what he's doing is he's pointing to this, this, this lifting up of the Son of Man on the cross that Jesus will take care of sin, will take the punishment of sin and rise victorious over the grave. And then he's saying, because of this, because of this, this reality, we will be able to be rescued and saved from our current standing, from that standing of condemnation. And 
So it's, it's being saved from the condemnation of sin and all the consequences that go with it of, of darkness and bondage and lostness and, and death, ultimately, unto this new position in Christ of being forgiven, of, of being saved unto life and freedom and life. So it's a total change of position. That's why in, 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 Paul says in Romans 8, 1, he says, therefore there is now no, what? Condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our, our current standing apart from Christ Jesus is already, it's not just someday. It's not like someday I'll stand before God and I'm in trouble. No, he's like, listen, apart from me, there's already trouble. You're already standing condemned. You just don't recognize it yet. And someday that will be affirmed before God. But in Christ, there is now, right? Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Saved from condemnation unto forgiveness, from darkness and lostness and bondage, unto light, freedom, and life. And all this really revolves around being disconnected or reconnected to the living God. It's not just a matter of getting a ticket to heaven someday, like, oh, I've, got, I've secured my retirement plan forever, you know? It, it, what, what, the, what it really revolves around is that you are disconnected from the author of life, and Jesus is saying that I am making a way for you to be reconnected to the living God. We're saved from being separated from God in our sin and unto reconciliation with God because of the righteousness of Christ. He's like, my righteous, I take your sin, and my righteousness becomes yours. We could also say that we've been saved from the dead end of living as kind of our own little mini-gods and unto the rightful lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. Jesus says it's interesting because he, he puts it in this relational, uh, this relational framework in John 17, 3. He says, now this is eternal life. What, just getting to heaven someday? Just, you know, floating around in the clouds? And No, he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and the one whom you've sent, Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, God has established a means of rescue. Now, here's the rub. Here's the thing that a lot of people find very difficult to accept. Through Jesus, God has established his only means of rescue. God doesn't live under the building code principle of many avenues of rescue because he offers one unfailing way. Our statement of faith reads, we believe that salvation originates with God and is sustained by his sovereign and loving grace, apart from any human effort, is based solely on Christ's saving work, is received by faith alone, and is expressed over a lifetime of developing holiness, obedience, and love. So here's our foundational Christian truth today. God's salvation is accessible to everyone, to all, but is accessible in Christ alone, by grace alone, and through faith alone. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. As for you, you were what? Dead. You were what? Dead. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature or flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But 
because of his great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us, what? Alive. <laughs> so what? Okay, so I want you to start just seeing the contrast here, right? You were dead in your transgressions and sins, right? You were lost. You were, you were a, a captive. You were bondage. You were under the, uh, the, the kingdom of the ruler of the air, right? But now God has changed all this. You were an object that, that was uh, at the mercy of these desires and, and of the flesh of the dead nature. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we had been dead or were dead in our transgressions. <coughs> it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Think of that positional change. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance to do. Boy, it sounds like God is the author of it all. The New Testament of God's Word unashamedly contends, and, and, really, and Jesus himself contends, that Jesus is the singular means of eternal life. The singular means of God's eternal salvation. That to be forgiven of sin, to be raised to life in spirit, to be reconciled to the living God, to have the promise of eternal life and eventually to, to see that reality happen in an immortal body, in a new creation, is only accomplished through Jesus. Now, some people would take that as a very arrogant statement. But I am, I, I tell you the truth, I am not trying to be arrogant. I am not trying to be intolerant. I am trying to speak the truth of what God reveals about himself. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peter says in Acts 4.12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Why? Let me give you my first great answer, right? Because only Jesus can do it. And only Jesus did do it. No one else has, can, will accomplish this for you. The Bible teaches that we were completely lost, completely in bondage to evil. And he says, listen, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The only path that we had before us as sinners, and God warned, we've gone through this, right? These should be building blocks. We're trying to build these blocks. God warned Adam and Eve, like, hey, listen, you, you walk away from me. You, you, give that, 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 you walk into that act of disobedience. I'm giving you generously the whole garden, the whole garden, the whole garden, just this one opportunity, right, to walk away from me. That's going to kill you. And that's what we've seen, right? Ever since then, spiritual death, physical death. This is why Romans 6.23 begins for the wages, right? The, the penalty, the payment, the consequence, the wages of sin is death. Left to ourselves, all we have is the prospect of rightly receiving what our sins deserve, death. And the dead can do nothing to rectify 
their own situation, right? You don't go to a, a funeral or a wake and, and start reasoning with a per, the person that's in the coffin. Well, let's work this out. Let's see. Maybe, we can, maybe, maybe you can get better if. Like, no. The dead can't do anything to remedy their own situation. We have no way to make right what has been made wrong. We need a source outside of ourselves to rescue us. We would need someone, in fact, that would be willing to die for us. We would need someone to say, listen, the, the wages of sin is death, so I will take that death for you. But here's the rub. For that to happen, that person would have to have no sin of their own. They would have to have no punishment due themselves. And guess what? There's only been one person like that. There's only been one sinless man. There's only one. There's only one that could ever say, I will take your place. I will step in as a substitute. I will receive the wrath of God for you. Right? So enter Jesus. The only one who could atone for someone else's sin. To willingly go from the glories of heaven to be a man to death to death on a cross. And so Romans 6.23 can conclude, right? It starts for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because only one could do it. And only one has done it. So, of course, this idea of Jesus being the exclusive way of salvation is difficult for many to accept. But think of the logic here, right? The Bible presents, as we've walked through, the Bible presents that the God of which it reveals is the only true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The God of uh, King David, the God of the prophets, the God that, that, that pointed to this, this coming anointed one, this Messiah, the God, the Father that sends Jesus, like he says, that's it. There's one true God. And, and that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he is God the Son, God in human flesh, that it blows our mind, like when we think of the Trinity, right, that God sends God to do the work of securing salvation for evil humanity by dying as a human. That this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that always say they're only one, right, this one triune God, God the Father sends God the Son as a human. You'll die as a human sacrifice for evil humanity. But when you think of it that way, so we start to say, how ridiculous is it that we would even think to go to this God and say, but God, let's, let, let's, let's work this out. I know you sent Jesus. And I know Jesus is God the Son. And I know Jesus like was tortured and killed and received your wrath for me, but... I'd like a different way. Maybe if I do this, maybe if I work hard enough, maybe if I believe this, <laughs> God's like, there's one way. And I've made that way. And that way will never be encumbered. That way will never be impassable. It's always available but it's only through Christ. And this is where we see that, that the Christian faith really is incredibly inclusive. Incredibly inclusive. Anybody, 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 come! But it's inclusive when we receive it on God's terms. The only way it's exclusive is when we say, we'll do it on our terms. God's salvation flows through Christ alone. If this is true, then we must, this must also stand to reason. That God's salvation is 100% purely a gift of God's grace. If we are dead in our transgressions and sins, 
And, and that means we have no chance to save ourselves and no merit of being saved. Then for God to make a way for rebellious creation to be rescued, it has to flow 100% from his goodness, from his love, from his grace. It must be a gift which no one could possibly deserve and is actually the opposite of what we deserve. Paul says, right, we just read in Ephesians 2, that we were by nature objects of wrath. That is just God's, that is God's steady position toward sin, toward rebellion, toward anything evil. We were by nature objects of wrath, standing condemned already, as Jesus says. But instead, for those who will say, I will take that one and only avenue of rescue, we experience God's kindness. This is grace. You need not and cannot make God love you any more or any less than he already does. It doesn't, that doesn't mean, you know, as we move in our walk with Christ, like he doesn't care. We'll get into that in the coming weeks. But you cannot make him love you more or less. His love is a fixed position towards you. You can't make him love you more with the good things you do. You can't make him less, love you less with, by the bad things you do. Again, not saying he doesn't care, but his love is a steady because God loves you because he loves you. God loves you because he is love. God loves you because he has chosen to set his affection on sinners. People are like, Jesus is hanging out with some really rough people. Really rough people. I mean, like, you all look really pretty compared to these folks that Jesus is hanging out with. And, you know, and, and these religious people come and they're like, hey, what are you doing hanging out with these, this crowd? This is like bottom of the barrel stuff. I didn't, I didn't come here. I didn't come here to fix good people, right? A doctor doesn't come for healthy people. A doctor comes for the sick. Someone, um, some people think that when bad things happen, God is punishing them. When good things happen, maybe God is rewarding them for being a good little boy or a good little girl. And, and I, I think, again, this is a sermon for a whole other day. Yeah, we all live in a broken world. We all live collectively in the consequences of, a, of humanity walking away from God. We all see the ugliness of it. I also understand that, that, that bad choices often kind of naturally lead to bad consequences. And there's some healthy choices we can make that will often lead to healthy consequences. But in all that, we need to remember this. God will never be any man's debtor. Romans 8.35 says, Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? Like, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> it's like, nobody. Who's ever, who's ever given to God? Has God, has, has God ever been in such need that he's like, oh, can you give me? Oh, thank you so much. And now I'm in your debt. I got to, no, that's never happened. God is no man's debtor. It's religion, right? Kind of the, in the biggest sense, like religion that tells us that somehow we can earn God's favor, we can put him in our debt, and then I can look down on, on all the, justify looking down on all those poor saps, all those sinners that aren't quite as good and pious as me. Let 
the late Brendan Manning wrote, every parable of mercy in the gospel was addressed by, uh, by Jesus to his opponents, murmuring scribes, grumbling, grumbling Pharisees, critical theologians, members of the Sanhedrin. They are the enemies of the gospel of grace, indignant because Jesus asserts that God cares about sinners, incensed that he should eat with people they despise. And what does Jesus tell them? These sinners, these people you despise, are nearer to God than you. It is not the hookers and the thieves who find it hard, find it most difficult to repent. It is you who are so secure in your piety and pretense that you have no need of conversion. They may have disobeyed God's call. Their professions have debased them, but they have shown sorrow and repentance. But more than any of that, these are the people who appreciate God's goodness. They are parading into the kingdom before you, for they have what you lack, a deep gratitude for God's love and a deep wonder at his mercy. You know, every single time that we, we're prone to applaud ourselves instead of give praise to God, <laughs> we, this thing kind of rears up in our heart that we realize, in my pride, I just want to save myself. I just want to say, God, I know you sent Jesus, but I can be a good enough little boy. And there's this, and, and Jesus is like, listen, you got to put that away. We applaud ourselves and we applaud ourselves and we do it quietly and it masks us humility sometimes. And, and we realize in that how earnestly we want to save ourselves and how difficult it is just to embrace God's grace. Just to come naked before him and be like, here I am, the mess that I am. You love me because you love me. You saved me because Jesus is righteous, not me. Our debt is holy to him. And many, many of our even supposed good deeds, right, are, are done with wrongful motivation and, and wrongful attitudes. This is why Isaiah 64, 6, Isaiah says, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. More literally, anyone want to say it? Menstrual cloths, tampons, maxi pads, right? That's what he's saying. And the reason he says that is not just because you're like, ew, that's dirty, right? The reason he says that is because in that Old Testament setting, it would have been something so clearly ceremonially unclean before God. He's presenting something that's ceremonially unclean and saying, here you are going, here's my good stuff, God. Have I put you in my debt? All of our efforts to establish God as our debtor are like this. The good deeds that Jesus accepts as holy are the deeds that are done as sacrifices of praise and sacrifices of worship and, and thanksgiving and generosity and service that flow from a gracious and humble devotion, that flow from being loved by God, not trying to get him to love me. Not from a posture of earning salvation, but from, from a heart of gratitude that recognizes that salvation is actually the opposite of what I deserved. But nonetheless, is mine according to his grace. For us, there is, as Ephesians 2, 9 tells us, no room to boast for the work is 100% of Jesus. And for Christians, we should, we should be echoing the scripture, let him who boasts, boast in what? In the Lord. God's grace is there for you on your best day. And God's grace is there for you on your worst day. God's grace is there for you when you're celebrating two years of sobriety. And God's grace is there for you on your 20th day of falling off the wagon. It's there for you when 
You are your best self, and it is there for you when you are your worst self. God's love and grace is no respecter of your highest highs and your lowest lows. One more time with Brendan Manning. He says, God has a single relentless stance towards us. He loves us. He is the only God man has ever heard of that loves sinners. False gods, the gods of human manufacturing, despise sinners. But the Father of Jesus loves all, no matter what they do. But of course, this is almost too incredible for us to accept. Nevertheless, the central affirmation of the Reformation stands through no merit of ours, but by his mercy, we have been restored to a right relationship with God through the life, death, and resurrection of his beloved son. This is the good news. This is the gospel of grace. And then lastly, very quickly, if salvation is in Christ alone, and if it is a gift of God that is received only by grace, then this must also stand to reason. We must have a way to receive this gift that involves, again, no merit on our part. A way that, that God has established in which we could not boast. We can't say, look what we did. Look how we cooperated with God. I, I had some part in this. God says, no, I'm going to give you a way that you're only going to boast in me. He says, here's the way. Faith. Just believe it. Just believe it. Faith becomes this. It just becomes my open hands. God, I'm a mess. You've got what I need. I believe it. I receive it. Je Jesus says, right, in that conversation with Nicodemus, for God so loved the world. He so loved broken people that he wasn't going to give up on them, right? He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes, whoever just has faith, whoever just opens their arms for the gift, opens their hands to receive, believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you done this? Or are you just trying to make your own way? Are you trying to find escape route number two? Ephesians 2.8 affirms that all of this, salvation and grace and even, even our faith constitutes a gift from God. But a gift never really transfers ownership until you receive it. A gift is only yours when you say, all right, here I am, I'll take it. Faith is the act of inner surrender of receiving. It's acknowledging, it's saying, Jesus, you are who you say you are, and I am who you say I am. You have died, you have risen, you have conquered sin and death, you are Lord, and I need you. Have you done this? Once truly received by faith, nothing can separate us from God's love. Jesus says in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them from my hand. Paul writes in, later in Romans 8, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble 
or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? Ah, oh, that's so good. That's so good. All right. I got one story for you, and I'm gonna, this is my wrap-up story. And so I just ask for your patience here. And um, I have been preaching for 16 years in this congregation, and I know there was one other time, some other time down the line that I read this story. But it's an oldie, but a goodie. So if you heard it before, just listen to it anew. This is uh, a story that relates something that uh, Tony Campolo uh, from Philadelphia experienced when he was down in Hawaii many years ago. He said, up a street I found a little place that was still open. I went in, took a seat on one of the stools at the counter, and waited to be served. This was one of those sleazy places that deserves the name Greasy Spoon. I did not even touch the menu. I was afraid that if I opened it, something gruesome would crawl out. But it was the only place I could find. The big guy, he doesn't say the big guy. This was written a couple decades before, so... He could say the fat guy, but I'm going to say the big guy behind the counter came over and asked me, what do you want? I said, I wanted a cup of coffee and a donut. He poured a cup of coffee, wiped his grimy hand on his smudged apron, and then grabbed a donut off the shelf behind him. I'm a realist. I know that in the back room of that restaurant, donuts probably drop on the floor and are kicked around. But when everything is out front where I could see it, I really would have appreciated if he just used a pair of tongs and placed the donut on some wax paper. As I sat there munching on my donut and sipping my coffee at 3.30 in the morning, the door of the diner suddenly swung open, and to my discomfort, in marched eight or nine provocative and boisterous prostitutes. It was a small place, and they sat on either side of me. Their talk was loud and crude. I felt completely out of place and was just about to make my getaway when I overheard a woman beside me say, tomorrow's my birthday. I'm going to be 39. Her friend responded in a nasty tone, so what do you want from me? A birthday party? What do you want? You want me to get you a cake and sing happy birthday? Come on, the woman said, sitting next to me. Why do you got to be so mean? I was just telling you, that's all. Why do you have to put me down? I was just telling you that it was my birthday. I don't want anything from you. I mean, why should, I, why should you give me a birthday party? I've never had a birthday party in my whole life. Why should I have one now? When I heard that, I made a decision. I sat and waited until the woman had left. Then I called the big guy from behind the counter and asked him, do they come in here every night? Yeah, he answered. The one right next to me, does she come in here every night? Yeah, he said, that's Agnes. Yeah, she comes in here every night. Why do you want to know? Because I heard her say that tomorrow's her birthday, I told him. What do you say that you and I do something about that? What do you think about us throwing a birthday party for her right here tomorrow night? A cute smile slowly crossed his chubby cheeks. And he answered with measure, a measured delight. That's great. I like it. Let's, that's a great idea. Calling to his wife, who did the cooking in the back room, he shouted, hey, come out here. This guy's got a great idea. Tomorrow's Agnes's birthday. This guy wants us to go in with him and throw a party for her right here tomorrow night. His wife came out of the back room, all bright and smiley. She said, that's wonderful. You know, Agnes is one of those people who is really nice and kind, but nobody does anything nice and kind for her. Look, I told him, if it's okay with you, I'll get back here tomorrow morning around 2.30 and decorate the place. I'll even get a birthday cake. No way, Harry said. That was his name. The birthday cake's my thing. I'll make the cake. At 2.30 the next morning, I was back in the diner. I picked up some crepe paper decorations at the store, made a sign out of big pieces of cardboard that read, Happy Birthday, Agnes. I decorated the diner from one end to the other. I had the diner looking good. 
The woman who did the cooking uh, must have gotten word out on the, on the street because by 3.15, every prostitute in Honolulu was in the place. It was wall-to-wall prostitutes and me. At 3.30 on the dot, the door of the diner swung open and in came Agnes and her friend. I had everybody ready. After all, I was a kind of the MC of this affair. And, and when, every, when they came in, we all screamed, Happy birthday! Never have I seen a person so flabbergasted, so stunned, so shaken. Her mouth fell open. Her legs seemed to buckle a bit. Her friend grabbed her arm to steady her. As she was led to sit on one of the stools along the counter, we all sang happy birthday to her. As we came to the end of our singing with happy birthday, dear Agnes, happy birthday to you, her eyes moistened. Then when the birthday cake with all the candles on it was carried out, she lost it and just openly cried. Harry gruffly mumbled, blow at your candles, Agnes. Come on, blow at the candles. If you don't blow them out, I'll blow them out for you. And after an endless few seconds, he did. Then he handed her the knife and told her, cut the cake, Agnes. Yo, Agnes, cut the cake. We all want some cake. Agnes looked down at the cake, and without taking her eyes off it, she slowly and softly said, Look, Harry, is it all right with you if, I mean, if, is it okay if I just kind of, what I want to ask you is, is it okay if I keep this cake for a while? I mean, is it all right if we don't eat it right away? Harry shrugged and answered, sure, it's okay. If you want to keep the cake, keep the cake, take it home if you want to. Can I? She asked. Then looking at me, she said, I live just a couple of streets down. I want to take the cake home, okay? I'll be right back, honest. She got off the stool, picked up the cake as if carrying it like the Holy Grail, walked slowly toward the door, and we all just stood there motionless as she left. When the door closed, there was a stunned silence in the place. Not knowing what else to do, I broke, in, I broke the silence by saying, what do you say we pray? Looking back on it now, it seems more than strange for a sociologist to be leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a diner at Honolulu, in Honolulu, Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning. But then it just felt like the right thing to do. I prayed for Agnes. I prayed for her salvation. I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. When I finished, Harry leaned over the counter with a trace of hostility in his voice, and he said, Hey, you never told me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to? In one of those moments, when just the right words came, I answered, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> Harry waited a moment and then almost sneered and answered, No, you don't. <laughs> He says, there's no church like that. If there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. Wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all like to join a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning? Well, that's the kind of church that Jesus came to create. God's grace comes and loves you right where you're at not because you deserve it. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has made a way for us, and it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Let's pray. Father God, all we can do is praise you that you have made a way where we literally had no way. That you have made a way back to yourself for those who are dead in their sins. That you have made a way out of that death and out of that condemnation unto freedom and forgiveness and reconciliation and light and life with you. 
We simply want to acknowledge this morning the profound truth that this way is only Jesus. That it's established in your love and your grace and it's received freely with no room to boast, only by faith. If any haven't done that, Lord God, even in this room this morning, I pray that they consider it seriously, the avenue that you've given for rescue, that they would turn to you and find life. For those of us who have, may we never stop marveling and living in this grace. May we never stop inviting other sinners just like us to this God that has loved sinners and called us unto himself. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.